Hello and welcome to the CircuitPython weekly meeting for March 15th, 2021. Uh, this is the time of the week where we get to talk together about all things CircuitPython. Uh, my name is Scott and I work for Adafruit on CircuitPython. Uh, CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to ro run on tiny, inexpensive computers called, called microcontrollers. Uh, CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to, to the URL adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Uh, this meeting typically happens at Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. The meeting time is changed. We'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified about changes to the meeting, you can add you to the CircuitPython Nisa's Discord role. There's also a calendar available that we try to keep updated if you'd like to subscribe to that. Uh, this meeting is recorded. We recorded the audio from the voice channel and video from the text channel. Uh, if you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you're still welcome to participate. Uh, the meeting of this meeting... Vi video of this meeting will be posted to YouTube and the audio is released as a podcast. If you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. There is a note stock to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate but can't make it to the meeting, you can leave hug reports and status updates for us in the notes document and we'll read them off during the meeting. The notes document also contains timestamps to go along with the video so you can use the doc to view only parts of the video you, that interest you most. The meeting run, tends to run 60 to 90 minutes so this gives you the op option to skip around. A link to the notes doc is posted in the CircuitPython channel on the Adafruit Discord every week. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc. Um, the meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. Uh, it's a chance to look at the project by the numbers and separate from what we're all up to and to ground us in reality away from the way that we're feeling about things. The third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, uh, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. Uh, the fourth part is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to, take a couple of minutes and talk about what we were doing in the last week, since the last meeting, and what we'll be up to over the next week. Uh, the fifth part is In the Weeds, uh, and final part. Uh, in the weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you, you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that covers how the meeting will go. Uh, with that, I'll get started with community news after I take a timestamp. So uh, first up on community news, uh, this is a preview of the community or the Python for microcontrollers newsletter is uh, Piper. Uh, I can't, I can't type and talk at the same time. Uh, Piper Make brings block programming to CircuitPython. Uh, Piper Learning is releasing a new product, Piper Make, which is a browser based coding platform for the Raspberry Pi Pico. It has a block programming interface based on Google Blockly, and the underlying code is CircuitPython. You can access the interface, which is similar to MakeCode, at make.playpiper.com. Under the hood, there is a CircuitPython helper library Piper has created with a, a link there from GitHub. Uh, for more details, check out uh, the Make article and YouTube. Next up in community news, the Adafruit Discord server surpasses 28,000 members. Um, the Adafruit Discord community, where we do all of our CircuitPython development in the open, reached over 28,000 humans. Thank you. Uh, Adafruit believes Discord offers a unique way for CircuitPython folks to connect. Join to get today at the URL adafru.it slash Discord. Uh, this is where the meeting is happening. And uh, just a huge hug report to all the new folks and all the mods who help keep it the wonderful place that it is. Um, Next up, uh, we had a number of soft releases that we're highlighting in community news. Um, first up, there's a new version of the CircuitPython Bundle Manager released including dependency detection um, on GitHub. That is um, github.com slash unsigned Arduino slash CircuitPython dash bundle dash manager. Um, next up, the Raspberry Pi team, 
Raspberry Pi team is posting examples of using PIO to make common interfaces on the Raspberry Pi Pico. And that is happening um, in the Pico examples directory or repository under the PIO folder. And last up, the Mew editor team is testing uh, version 1.10 beta 2, which is the first public beta. So check that out um, for Mew. And thank you, I think, Foamy Guy for posting all of those links. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at uh, adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Um, to contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub uh, under the github.com slash adafruit slash CircuitPython dash weekly dash newsletter repository. There's a, you'll see a drafts folder there. Uh, and submit a, submit a pull request. Um, there's a link here to editing files in a repository with changes. Uh, you may also tag a tweet with CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And I'd just like to reiterate, um, this is how we get content for the newsletter. So if you are seeing people doing cool things with Python, um, please, please, you know, email cpnews at adafruit.com with those links. Uh, we'd love to highlight them in the newsletter. Okay, and with that, uh, let's continue on uh, to the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Um, this is an objective kind of statistics-based ba view. Uh, <laughs> Jeff points out self-promotion is totally legitimate to your project or your friend's projects. Are uh, you know as long as they're related to Python, uh, we'd love to see those in the newsletter too. Um, so state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka is a, an objective view of the health of the project and these major subcomponents of CircuitPython broadly. Um, and it's geared towards uh, giving us some like concrete things to base our feelings on how things are going with. So um, these numbers are, are kind of numbers we track week to week. But if folks do have ideas on um, new numbers that we should be tracking, please let us know. We'd love to evolve this, or we're, we're certainly open to, to evolving it. Um, so overall, we had 73 pull requests merged uh, from 22 diff different authors, um, which is really great. Um, the f I'll just go through here, and for the folks that I don't recognize, so there's Noah Code, um, Tom O'Ray, uh, Cognitive Gears, Flavio Fernandez are all TWA127, Alex Colello. Um, Tesla K2, K20 are all names that I don't think we've seen before. So thanks to all the new folks and thanks to the total 22 authors. Um, nine reviewers. So thank you to all our reviewers. As always, we couldn't have this many authors with this many, without these many reviewers. So uh, always we're looking for, for new reviewers. It's a great way to help us grow the community. Uh, issues wise, we had 36 closed issues by 12 people and 27 opens by 21 people. So we're net down nine, which is amazing. Uh, thank you to everybody who's been helping knock out issues. And with that, uh, let me go to the core statistics before we hand it over to other folks for the other two parts. Um, on the core side, we had 11 pull requests merged from eight different authors. So thank you to those eight authors. Uh, we had four reviewers, so thank you to reviewers as well. We have. 21 open pull requests, uh, where a number of them are a number of them are growing in age. So again, as always, as I say every week, uh, if you're involved in any of these pull requests uh, or not, um, and want to help us get through this backlog, we'd we'd really appreciate it. Um, we really do want to keep the number of open pull pull requests down. Um, either they could get picked up and finished, or they can just be closed if their uh, people have lost interest in them. Issues wise, in the core, we had three closed issues by two people and seven opens by six people. So we are net up four uh, for a total of 419 open issues. You can see all of the issues at github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython slash issues. Um, the way that we keep track of how we're doing on issues, this, this number does tend to grow slowly, uh, but we do want to prioritize how we uh, take a look at those issues and what we worry about. We have a long-term category. 
uh, by category, I mean milestone, which is all the stuff that we we w would like to do at some point, but we have no priority to do urgently. Um, and then we have three milestones related to six, and we have a 7.0 milestone as well. Um, we have four issues, not a milestone, so those will need to be triaged. And that's uh, kind of the breakdown for where we are with issues. And with that, uh, let's kick it over to Katni for the stats on the libraries. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is across all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries and a few extras. So everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and also the community bundle and our uh, cookie cutter um, is covered here as well. We had 58 pull requests merged from 15 different authors and seven reviewers. Um, most of those were less than a week old. Two of them were older. It's good to see that we are keeping up with both older ones, but also that we um, are, are keeping up with them as they come in as well, uh, leaving us with 57 open pull requests. Uh, there were 31 issues closed by 12 people and 17 open by 13 people, which is excellent to see. And so that leaves us with 292 open issues. If you are interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, consider going to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all this information, uh, open pull requests and open issues, uh, as well as library infrastructure issues and how to translate uh, or how to contribute translating to core CircuitPython. Um, you can search the issues for good first issue if that's where you're at and you're new to everything. Um, or if you're looking for something a little more complicated, bug or enhancement is also excellent. And um, if you're looking to start reviewing, uh, you can go through the open pull requests and comment on them. Take a look at the code. If you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, let us know that you looked at the code. It looks good to you, um, you know, that you didn't test it. But any kind of review uh, helps us. And that is an excellent way to start reviewing is to just leave a comment on an open PR. And... Um, that can build you up to actually joining our review team, um, which we're always looking for more folks to join the review team, because as Scott may or may not have said, um, the more reviewers we have, the more authors we can support. Uh, so we had one new library, it looks like, in the last week, the SSD 1680, and uh, a number of updated libraries as well that I will not read off individually, but I will note that the community bundle saw an update um, and that's been really great to see the community bundle in the um, list pretty regularly either for new libraries joining it or um, updates to current libraries that folks are developing and that's where we are at the libraries awesome thank you Katni and next up we're going to check in with maker Melissa about Blinka hello oh hold on okay I lost my tab for a second here. Uh, for Blinka, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers this week, we had four pull requests merged by three authors and one reviewer. Uh, we had we have four open pull requests still, and there were two closed issues by one person and three open by three people, leaving a net of 57 open issues. Uh, there were 3,324 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we are currently supporting 70 boards. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Hug Reports. Uh, this is a chance for us to say thank you to folks for the work that they've been doing within the community and the wider world. Uh, it is done as a round robin, so I will start and we'll go through the list. Uh, we did cover it. Um, if you want to, if you are in the meeting uh, and want to follow the along in the notes doc, that's the the easiest way to follow along. Um, anybody who's uh, in the notes doc or marked as and not in the meeting, not in the voice channel or marked as text only, I will read off. Um, and as always, if you're unable to make the meeting but want to participate, you can also leave notes in the notes doc uh, as well. So let me take a time code. So for myself, I have two. Uh, thank you to Microdev for setting up the issue templates. It's uh, been awesome to see folks actually picking up and using those. And then also thank you to Luke W from Raspberry Pi for helping with some Flash stuff on the RP2040. Uh, those are my two hug reports for this week. And now we've got 
to from V923Z, who's not in the meeting, so I'll read off. Uh, hug report to David uh, Gloud for a very interesting discussion on his thermal camera stuff. And a group hug. That I will scroll up. And I've got notes from Brent. So Brent says group hug and uh, a hug report to J Posada 202020 and Quir Timer for PRs into the CircuitPython Jupiter kernel. Uh, one hug for the RP2040 and one for inline magics that allows C Python code to be executed in the same notebook as CircuitPython code. Really powerful stuff can already think about the applications of this. And with that, I've got another couple to read off. Um, first, from C. Grover, we have a group hug to the team and the community. And from Charles, uh, we have a group hug and happy Pi Day. And with that, we'll go to Dan. I'm eating and having a snack, so hold on a second. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Snacks are important. Doing, yeah. I'd like to thank um, Gadgetoid, who's um, working at Pi Maroney. And we've had some back and forths about um, RP2040 I2C, which is the, the hardware peripheral on the chip is slightly peculiar. And it works with some chips and not others. And he is testing some things and I have contributed. And we have some synergy going on here, which is good. And then also in I, the I2C land, I'd like to thank S. Patrick W., Microdev, and Ski East who um, tested my fix for uh, ESP32 S2 I2C interaction, bad interaction with Wi-Fi. And I think kind of together, we're continuing to look at this to kind of understand like what the heck is going on here because the, the fix doesn't make that much sense from a coding point of view, but it, it, it really does something. And it, it's probably some code as I'll talk later that we can't see that's going bad. Mm -hmm. OK. Thanks, Dan. All right, next up, a couple more notes. So notes from Dave P says, uh, hug report to Tan Newt for his careful and patient reviews of my RP2040 Pulse IOPR. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. I Thank you for doing that, Dave. Uh, next up from David Glaub, we have a hug report to Maker Melissa for fast response times on further IS31 FL3731 improvements. A uh, hug report to V923Z for helping me with Microlab for thermal camera usage. Hug report to Gadgetoid for discussion on CircuitPython support for the breakout garden. A uh, hug report to Jeff Epler for the Feather RP2040 RGB matrix guide just in time. And a hug report to Deshipu for breaking the group limit in display I.O. This is so last week hug report. <laughs> uh, good to reiterate. And next up, we have Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, this week, I got hugs for uh, Kmatch98 and Jose David for helping out with the documentation for the display text library. Uh, both of those folks did a bunch of great work to compile lots of the information that went into the, the new learn guide. So I really appreciate that. Uh, also, 2K Match 98 for working on a really nice dial gauge uh, widget, and um, as well for enhancing a new icon widget with uh, an animation. So you can uh, click on it and get a little animated action. Um, to J Posada 2020, uh, Jose David, um, for some great additions in display text, uh, namely the ability to use the baseline alignment with anchored position. Um, also, directional labels are really cool, so we can have labels in different orientations now. And then uh, the last one there uh, for Jose David in this is for the new font, uh, added a new example font you can use in the examples. Uh, so thank you for all of those. Um, Jeff E, uh, Jeff Hepler last night, I think it was last night or the night before, created a, a really cool enhancement in the core uh, in bitmap tools and also inside of um, the bitmap font library that makes it quicker uh, to load fonts again. So another really nice speed up there. Thank you to Jeff. Um, Ann B and Katni, uh, both for all their work on the newsletter and delivering you know, a steady stream of really interesting Python news and projects every week. Um, we got a, a taste earlier in the meeting, uh, but I also had a peek yesterday and saw that the uh, the newsletter is loaded up with all kinds of good stuff this week. Um, and lastly, to a GitHub user, 
Flavio Fernandez. Um, they fixed a bug that I had actually introduced in display text when I was doing refactoring. So thank you for uh, that fix PR there. That's all for me. Awesome. Thank you, Foamy Guy. And next up is Hire Effect. Alrighty, uh, this past week, thank you to uh, Tio Mitch for their work on an implementation of audio PWM IO for the STM32 port. Uh, they did a great job of fitting that in nicely with the existing timer system. So I'm going to be trying that out today. Uh, thanks for all the hard work on that. Uh, thanks to Microdev and Ask Patrick W for their continued work on trying to update the ESP uh, IDF, ESP32 IDF, um, which seems like it's got some some uh, annoying problems, so thanks for sticking with it. Uh, thanks to Dan for finally tracking down that ESP32 S2 bug, um, which uh, sounds like, I know that there were other people who were involved with that fix, um, and uh, just hearing it described was like, all right, yeah, that's, uh, it seemed like a team effort job to finally nail that thing. Um, thanks to Jason Meckham, whose uh, tag is a lot of letters and numbers that are hard to pronounce, uh, for reporting a issue with the UART DNIT on the STM32 have been hanging out for a long time. And thanks to you, Scott, for reviews and approvals of my bug fixes this past week. And that's it for me. Thanks, Hire Effect. Next up is Hugo. Should I read it off for you? Did I? Okay. Uh, Hugo says, a hug reports Dan for the info on good places to check for computer purchases and for a hug report to Katni for a pleasant chat. And next up we have Jeff. Hello. Uh, first, I want to give you a hug report for figuring out that flash reliability problem on the RP2040. Uh, to Katni for helping me find the right page on Learn when I couldn't find the info I needed. I assume she just has a list of every page in her head. Uh, to Jerry for testing some PRs, and uh, we discussed some confusing aspects of how the RTC module works. And to Microdev for work on that code formatting PR, which I was seeing in the chat, we may be able to merge soon. So that will be nice to have done. Yeah, it looks like there's two checks in progress on that. Uh, next up is Jerry. Next up is Jerry. Hello. Uh, yeah, thanks to Jeff for fixing that. RTC issue and explaining to me how, they, how it's supposed to work. And a uh, group, group hug, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. All right. Next up, we have Jose David. Jose says, uh, hug report to Foamy Guy for the excellent work in the display text guide. Hug report to Quer Timer for working on executing Python native code in the Jupyter Notebook Circuit Python kernel. This will allow users to use both in the same notebook. Hug reports Jerry N for helping me debug my RFM X feather. Hug reports Scott that always is always open to answer questions in other Discord channels about Circuit Python. Hug report to Kmatch98 for all the help and reviews. And lastly, hug report to Hugo for helping me understand GitHub and cherry picking. Next up is Katni. So I have a hug report for Dylan for all of the work on Adabot. We've been uh, running patches and also adding features and updating current features. And Dylan's been putting all the work in there. A hug report to Summersoft for popping in to help with some of the Adabot updates. To Sheehan from the Learn Dev team. Uh, it's our internal team that works on the Learn system uh, for dealing with all the bugs I found in a new Learn feature. Uh, to Foamy Guy for all the work on all the things. To SAK917 on GitHub for picking up some older issues and beginning with good first issues. And to Hugo for adding another pre commit hook to Cookie Cutter to cover tests. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Next up is Kmatch98. Thanks, Scott. So, first off, Foamy Guy for the new Display Text Learn Guide and also the addition of the new icon widget uh, for the touch deck. Uh, thanks to Jose David for all, a whole bunch of additions to uh, display text. Uh, so thanks for sticking to it and, and uh, working through the refactor as well. Um, thanks to Warrior of Wire for the vector IO library. Seems like an underutilized, or at least I, I wasn't as aware of that library. So it's got a huge capability for drawing polygons, particularly if you want to move them around a lot. It's a good, good addition. Uh, next to Maker Melissa for adding rotation to the matrix portal, something a user asked for in the 
in the Discord chat. Uh, thanks to Jepler for the new bitmap loading tool and for some warnings of how to use and, and what to watch out for on that. Thanks for that. Uh, and then finally, there's just been a wealth of uh, Discord members that are showing their matrix portal and magtag projects are, are really cool. So thanks to everybody for sharing those. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kmatch. And next up is Maker Melissa. Just want to give a group hug. Thank you, Melissa. And last up, we have notes from Microdev, who says a group hug. Uh, hug reports Dan H for looking into the ESP32 S2 I squared C issue, and uh, to Jepler for solving my code formatting PR issues. With that, that's hug reports. Thank you all. Uh, next up, we have another round robin, but this time it's status updates. Uh, status updates is a chance for us to talk about what we've been working on in the past week and what we plan on working on in the coming week. It's a great way for us to uh, have a feeling for what all is going on and also to collaborate across uh, projects if folks have related info between folks uh, or b between what they've been doing and what somebody's doing now. And I'm scrolling down, so I will start. So for myself, um, last week I did uh, further flash work, um, including, I, I need to check this in, but there's a tabulate. I added a tabulate function to Cascade Tomal, which will allows me to have a spreadsheet of all the flash settings for everything. So it's really great for seeing, like, understanding commonalities amongst flashes. Um, and then the, the end of the week was debugging the, the unreliability of flash on the Feather RP2040. Uh, it turned out we were just running it too fast, um, but it took some... It's, it's not obvious that that's the problem. Uh, this week, I'll focus on the C version of the QSpy init and um, should be able to make a pretty versatile version that we'll use for hopefully a lot of the upcoming Adafruit boards and also allow us to switch chips um, which would be cool. And then I also have to check that in the Pico SDK to make sure that we're, we're working well in the Pico SDK as well. Um, next up, I have notes from V923Z, who says, added functions to Microlab to interface with peripheral devices producing 32-bit integers, uh, which sounds very interesting and intriguing. Um, and then circling back, we've got notes from Brent. So Brent says, got to work with the Pico of it and the Pico Feather. Uh, wrote a quick start guide for adding Wi-Fi to the CircuitPython RP2040 projects. Uh, briefly gets you started with sending RP2040 data with HTTP and MQTT. And uh, mostly working on non-CircuitPython projects with some CircuitPython sprinkled here and there. Next up are notes from C. Grover, who says, last week submitted a PR to include a settable brushed DC motor recirculation current load parameter for the Adafruit CircuitPython motor dot motor library. Learned a bit more about Pilot in the process, start, starting work on the learning learn guide rewrite in anticipation of the PR merge. Uh, this week, we'll address converting raw measurements to LUX and UVI for the LTR390 true UV sensor. Plans are to update the supporting library. Uh, spotted a Stemma DRV8830 voltage regular motor controller in the wild on Lady Ada's desk. Excited to get my hands on one for testing. Unrelated, after months of downsizing, the commercial side of the recording studio is now officially closed. Not sure how the space will be reconfigured just yet, but it will certainly involve multiple strings of NeoPixels and the underutilized Ecorns recliner. I uh, probably really butchered the name of that recliner, but that's okay. <laughs> and next up, we have Dan. Okay. Um, in Beta 3, we uh, introduced a second USB serial channel, which is very useful, but it also means that all the boards now show up with like two COM ports or two dev TTY ports, which is confusing. And some people had scripts that chose one of those uh, to determine which was the REPL port. And they weren't necessarily in the same order all the time. And so we've turned that feature off now. It's still there if you want to build it, but it's not on by default. And in 7, and as we get Mu and other things up to speed, then we'll probably may turn it back on, or we may make it uh, be able to turn it back on at runtime in boot.py, which would be kind of the right thing to do. Um, 
because of this problem, I started working on a simple library uh, which uses PySerial to be able to identify which port is which. You can because they actually they're they're tagged uh, with descriptor names, though they're not so easy to get to sometimes. And I'm going to submit a PR to Mu to be able to um, use we'll use this library to be able to identify which channel is the REPL channel. And then finally, uh, another big thing was um, not another big thing, but a big thing was that after a lot of uh, hairy uh, like divide and conquer work, I like narrowed down the ESP I2C Wi-Fi interaction problem um, to a particular place in uh, the ESP IDF in the I2C driver. And I changed the way it does something when it deallocates some storage. And now it works. It's not really clear why this change works because the old way isn't obviously wrong, but there's something really peculiar. And I tried to debug further down and I ended up getting stuck at a brick wall because part of the, though a lot of the ESP IDF is open source, there are some critical parts like the Wi-Fi stack that are closed source. And so it's a binary blob. And I, I looked at the disassembled source, but it didn't get anywhere with that. So uh, we will probably report this bug up the chain and say, here's what the fix is, and then see whether we can get uh, ESP folks to work on it. OK. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. All right, next up we have notes from David Glad, who says, text scrolling demo for Michael Horn on his 11 by 7 matrix breakout, plus fix the Y access mirror after he tested my code on the hardware. Uh, driver and simple test for the 5x5 RGB matrix. Uh, untested because I don't have the hardware. Uh, link to the Twitter status there. Uh, MagTag plus SCD30 to display CO2. Uh, did not wait, find a way to power off the sensor during sleep. Uh, the fat for, on Pico with the zero form factor. Googly eyes on scroll uh, fat HD. Uh, thermal camera MLX plus my Pi Mini TFT. These are There's all Twitter links here. If folks want to check the note stock for that. Uh, zero segment, which is a max 7219 plus eight, uh, seven segments plus two buttons. Uh, accelerated thermal camera with micro lab seat in the weeds. Got my Feather RP2040. Um, <laughs> funny slash sad non circuit Python news. Got a vaccine shot. Unfortunately, only tetanus because I walked on two nails. Well, I hope, I hope that's okay. Hope your uh, foot's okay after doing that, David. And next up is Foamy Guy. Alrighty, thanks, Scott. Um, for last week, I finished up the display text guide, and that got published on um, I think Monday or Tuesday last week. The uh, I began work on a touch deck project in collaboration with JP, and I finished up the refactoring in display text, and that got merged. And then I got through a bunch of the reviews of uh, PRs that were waiting on that uh, refactoring. Um, for this week, I will be uh, tonight. I got my, um, got my three and a half inch feather wing in the mail today. So I'll be converting the touch deck code tonight to work with that feather RP2040 in the feather wing. Um, I am going to try to make a configuration layer for PyCharm with helpful Git commands inside that, a little macro screen, a little macro touchscreen there. And then um, also this week, I want to print one of the enclosures uh, for it once that is created and available. Um, other stuff this week, I'll be finishing up a last uh, couple few uh, reviews on display text and display IO layout. Um, I will be... I have a, an idea for a game that I think I'm going to work on, uh, an Easter-themed game. So you're going to play a bunny, and you'll uh, wander around, and you have to try to find eggs, and you have to eat carrots to get energy. And then when you run out of energy, uh, that will be the end of the level. It will count up your eggs, and you go to the high score and stuff. So I'll work on that uh, maybe starting out this week. And then the last thing is um, I noticed there was no helper library, uh, I don't think. I took only a quick glance, so maybe I just missed it. But I didn't see a helper library for the 3.5-inch Featherwing. Um, if that's the case that there actually is not one, then I might make that this week and add it to the, the Featherwing Helper Library. Um, and that's all I got. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Foamy Guy. Uh, next up is Hierofact. 
Alrighty, uh, Chrome, please. Let me scroll down. Okay. Um, last week, uh, I've I've had a couple of weeks, so I'm I've uh, I'm a little bit behind on my SCM32 power stuff, but that has been uh, my continuing focus. Um, it's uh, mostly done. I've just got some deep sleep interrupt stuff that has been uh, really kind of slowing things down. So I'm going to keep tr cracking at it today, but I'm also trying to just make myself available on other stuff. Um, I fixed some minor uh, bugs, uh, like a dnit problem with uh, UART on the STM32, and um, a update to the STM32F4 discovery board, which uh, can do everything the uh, STM32F405 Feather can, uh, since they have the same silicon, but just need some copy pasting to bring it back up to speed. Um, and I also did a little bit of research. We've been having a discussion on one of the issues about uh, overclocking and clock options uh, in CircuitPython and whether those should be able to be dynamically changed either actually during runtime or at least um, during soft reboots uh, so that you can get better power performance or um, lower noise or uh, do overclocking for just uh, higher speeds. So uh, I did a little bit of looking into how that might work for uh, the chips in our various ports. Uh, this week, um, I'm going to be testing the new audio PWM IO uh, uh, PR that has come in. I'm going to try and nail this deep sleep stuff finally. Uh, I get some notes on low power consumption uh, so that you can compare chips uh, from different ports on how their power consumption during deep sleep and light sleep looks like. Um, I'm going to try and at least bundle RTC in with any of the deep sleep stuff that comes in since it's like two functions and is basically done already. So it's virtually no effort. Um, and then uh, I'm generally available for other stuff that's coming in. Um, I, I've had some stuff added to my to-do list, so we'll see what happens with that. And that's it for me. Awesome. Thanks, Higher Effect. Uh, next up is Hugo. All right. I hope I can be heard now. Yep. Sounds good. Uh, so last week, I uh, got some progress bar code refactored to appease the pile and duplicate code rule that basically singled me out for the work I did previously. Um, and started looking to the uh, crash issue related to bitmaps on the Mac. Uh, this week, uh, I'm pushing the refactor and looking into the bitmap crash issues some more and uh, eventually learn how to deal with push to talk on Discord. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, next up is Jeff. Hello. Um, I went over and started reviewing that PR, um, but so I'll get back to my notes here. <laughs> um, so last week, I wrote a new guide on Circuit Sculpture, which is live on the Adafruit Learn system. I enabled MP3 playback on the RP2040, but only extremely low bitrate files work. Um, the MP3 library that we use assumes that there are some efficient instructions for particularly multiplying uh, two 32-bit numbers to get a 64-bit number. And that turns into a sequence of about 25 instructions on the Cortex-M0 of RP2040, and that's not good enough. So I uh, fixed a bug with the RTC on the RP2040, uh, reverted a space-saving commit, um, but we may need to reevaluate it now that we better understand the flash problems we were having on RP2040 there's a flag for whether multi-partition flash devices are supported, and we don't use it. Uh, I put in a pull request to save, I forget, it was 160 bytes or something, by disabling it. In the midst of that, I had it fail. I had it make storage be lost on one of my RP2040 boards, or storage data erase file system didn't work or something, so we reverted it. But maybe we should put that back in. Last week, I ran the meeting. Uh, I had put in a bug for certain PCF font, it didn't read right with our font reader library that was merged. And I updated the RGB matrix guide with a new page for the RP2040, including a new scroller, which says RP2040 Feather on top of the Raspberry Pi logo. What's nice about the Feather is you can use the um, Feather wing that's designed for the um, SAMD51, the Feather M4. Um, and that works just fine and dandy. Um, so if you have that combo of hardware, check it out. It's an easy way to do the Pico and the Matrix together, and there's plenty of RAM, so that's always good when you're doing Matrix stuff. Anyway, uh, this week, 
Um, I have it written down to see if Audio Mixer can be enabled on our RP2040, but I think we're going to punt that. Uh, for myself, I want to uh, add to the uh, RP2PIO module the ability to choose the pin that is used by the jump pin instruction. I'm going to test I2S out for the Pico slash RP2040, and it looks like the next after that is starting on some IMX stuff, in particular starting with just getting a handle on how the built-in USB bootloader works on the IMX 1011 uh, microcontroller, which I have a dev kit for. And as for fun stuff, I've continued working on my WWVB clock. Uh, it was daylight saving time change this weekend, so of course there is a daylight saving time bug. Uh, I tried to fix it, but I can test it next year. And uh, I'll also be moving that from a matrix portal to a Feather RP2040 Feather a Feather RB2040. Um, and the reason that will be better than the Matrix Portal is the Feather has a crystal. And so when the time, when when the locally tracked time stays closer to the true time, its ability to read the WWVB signal is improved. So that will uh, kind of help make it work better. That's what I'm up to. I'm up to. All right, next up is right, Jerry. Next up is Jerry. Uh, hello. Let's see. Uh, so mostly, I, I can't remember what I did last week, but I had fun playing with all my toys. Um, one thing I did come across, and I, I've been just trying it periodically whenever new kernel updates come out for the Pi. So I know there's been an ongoing problem with the Pi TFT kernel and the BrainCraft hat. And finally this week when I just tried it, it all worked. So maybe it's, maybe it's all better now. At least it worked for me. And uh, the same load I can, I can run my AMG8833 thermal camera or play with the BrainCraft hat using the TensorFlow stuff without breaking the display. So that's a big improvement. And next week, I'll probably do the same stuff. Um, I do want to hope to add that uh, I, I was playing with Dan's um, library for the LYWS D03 MCC, the, the Mija, whatever, um, little thermometer, and um, marveling at how simple his library is to read the, uh, the temperature and humidity data out of it. So I thought, well, gee, I wonder if I can get the battery monitor out of that. So I thought I'd try and add that. Maybe I'll find out why why it isn't there. But um, it's been fun to delve into, and all it's taught me is just how how much I how little I understand about how all the BLE stuff works anyway. So good to play with. And then there's some stuff going on with the fingerprint library. There was some additions put in a week or two ago for a new sensor to add some stuff that doesn't work with some of the old sensors. So I'm gonna hope to try and straighten that out if I can. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have notes from Jose David, who says, Last week, uh, PR adding a solution for K3 walls for the I2C peripheral SAMD51 corrections in the control C bit. Uh, draft PR for the Feather RP2040 I2C peripheral. Corrections for the PRs for display text. PR for directional label. Uh, exploring how to port encoding polylines to CircuitPython. PR for label styles and some PR for core documentation. Uh, this week, work on com on the comments from Scott on IS squared Z peripheral. Uh, review and corrections of core documentation. Read the docs related to issue uh, three two one, which is a really old issue. Uh, corrections on feedback for directional label and if decided path to take. Work in the style library. And next up is Katney. All right. So last week. Um, had Hugo update the cookie cutter to include a new pre-commit to run PyLint on the test directory, similarly to how examples is run, um, so that we can avoid the duplicate code issue on the tests directory as well. Um, and I also, I guess I didn't put this in there, but, uh, had Dylan add that to, um, at least I think he did anyway. I asked, I told him to find out what other libraries had test directories. I don't know if he followed through with um, adding the hook or not, but um, we looked into that as well. Um, random note, I updated the fritzing app to the latest version and so far haven't run into any issues. Um, it's worth noting because I, I think the last release was three or four years ago. <laughs> so it, it's kind of a big deal that they did another release. Um, I added a reverse lookup, quote unquote, pinouts list to the Feather RP2040 pinouts page. So the pins are now listed both by pin name equals functionality and then also pin function equals pin names. 
So if you are looking to see what pin five does, um, you know, what D5 does, you can look for D5 and find out what it does. But if you're looking to find out what pins support SPI, you can look at what uh, what pins support what SPI and then um, find out the pin names that way. Uh, where did I leave off? Um, updated the AMG 8833 guide for the STEM and QT revision. Worked with Anne further on ta interim taking over the newsletter. Uh, wrote the first template in the Learn system with the new templating feature. Um, the first template is blank using the D13 LED. Found a ton of bugs with the new templating feature in Learn, um, which is what led to my hug report for Learn Dev, um, dealing with everything I found. Um, and the other miscellaneous stuff I'm sure I'm forgetting. So this week, um, I already had this chat with Brent about getting date time passing PyLint. Uh, this was from a previous discussion in this meeting. Um, the tests are failing miserably, but they're based on CPython, and so we're not going to redo them all. Um, so I, I talked to Brent about adding the global pilot disables to those files um, to get that passing, and that is now on Brent's radar. Uh, continue on the template creation mission. The eventual plan is to ostensibly recreate the Circuit Python Essentials Guide with templates. So instead of mirroring the Essentials Guide into every board guide, every board guide will have its own tailored pages. So we're not dealing with, you know, but my board looks different or there's no LED or whatever other feedback is constantly coming up because the Essentials Guide was written to be generally applicable, not specifically applicable. Um, so that's kind of what the point of this template engine is, is to be able to create um, as much content as possible so that the least amount of effort has to go into putting it into a guide. Um, but for example, blinking an external LED might have a template and there will be space for you to put a wiring diagram for that particular board and maybe the code um, based on what pin you use. Um, and then the rest of it would be done, uh, something like that. Um, so that's going to take a lot of time. <laughs> At least initially, we're working backwards on the boards um, in terms of when they were released. Um, but that's going to happen over time. But hopefully all future board guides will have this to begin with. Um, we had a very polite request to add information to the clue guide about um, information on the debug pins. So I'll be doing that sometime this week. Uh, eventually going to be doing the new products process for the new Cyberdeck, uh, which was recently released. Um, just need to put together files and put out the PCB files and that sort of thing for it. And um, need to finish up the MIDI Featherwing guide. However, it turns out I already did it a while ago. So that was convenient. So I need to review it and get it to uh, Lamore um, for her to look at. But it turns out I, I actually already did that. So passed me. Thanks. <laughs> hug, hug report passed me. Yes. <laughs> And it's that's good. what I'm up to. It's good when it works out that way rather than the reverse. Pretty much. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, next up is Kmatch. Okay, thanks. So this week I added a couple of basic features to the bitmap tools to allow painting either rectangular regions or lines into existing bitmaps. Um, I helped uh, with Pomi Guy's icon widget, added a little animation so you get some feedback when you press press the widget. Uh, and then I uh, updated my dial widget so it's it's maybe suitable for others to use and give it uh, more flexibility than my original one did, and I submitted that. Uh, this week I hope to wrap up the widgets I had, had in mind and get those submitted. One is an annotation where you can draw lines and arrows and, and text on a, on a widget or on the screen. And then uh, another input where you can flip through different inputs, uh, and I hope to get those submitted. And then once that's done, I hope to get an example of all the cool new widgets that are that are in there now to highlight uh, what their capabilities are. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Kmatch. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. So last week, I wrote a CircuitPython driver for the SSD 1680. I updated the CircuitPython EPD library to add the SSD 1680 as well. I wrote a 2.13 inch EPD or e-paper display guide. Um, I created a uh, pull request for the uh, RP LiDAR to add 
additional functionality, but uh, I need to update it some more because it's not working on the very latest firmware. Um, need to look into an issue where a user, or I looked into an issue where a user was having trouble updating uh, the Wi-Fi coprocessor firmware and helped them with that. Uh, I fixed an issue with the 2.7 inch e-paper display in Arduino where the red and black were swapped. Uh, this week I am uh, just working on some miscellaneous GitHub issues, uh, possibly starting a 2.9 inch e-ink guide, uh, which will mostly be gathering pages from existing guides and making them look more uniform. And uh, probably work on a the RP LiDAR library a bit more. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, and last up, we have notes from Microdev, who says, uh, did some ESP32S2 I2C work and IDF update work, uh, added code formatting and translation checks to pre-commit, and just a heads up for anybody who's working in the core, um, the PR for the code formatting and the translation checks was just merged. Um, so it's likely that if you have any pending code for the core that you're going to have to rerun uh, the formatting on it. Although it was added to pre-commit, so maybe it will do it automatically. Um, but just be aware that that's happening. And uh, the reason that's, that we're doing it is because uh, MicroPython adopted a standard C formatting after um, after we had previously merged. So... This is a this is a kind of precursor to getting us updated to newer MicroPython. So uh, it's a great thing. Uh, code formatting is the way to go, and a uh, huge uh, hug report to Microdev for taking that work on. Um, and yeah, Microdev says having pre-commit is highly recommended. So if you haven't done that yet, uh, now is a great time to do it. And uh, lastly, uh, last up, we have in the weeds here. Uh, thank you everybody for status updates. Um, in the weeds is a chance for us to just have any sort of longer form discussion uh, as we need it. Um, and if you have any topics, there are a few here already. So if you do have um, some more, uh, go ahead and add them down along with your name. But um, for now, uh, we will... <laughs> I hear Foamy Guy's already getting ready. So we'll yep, kick sorry. it over to Foamy Guy for the first topic here. Um, so this came out of a discussion on a, a PR for display text uh, is kind of where we started. But the, the core idea was kind of adding themes or styles. Um, so a, kind of a bunch of presets of different colors that look good together. Um, and then creating a way to make it easy for folks to kind of apply those themes or styles onto their, um, onto their labels. So I was thinking about it a little bit, and, and I talked with Jose a little bit um, over my stream. We were talking about it, and my idea was maybe it might be good to create a new library, like a new color helper library, uh, which could contain things like helper functions for converting between uh, numeric hex, uh, tuples, and string hex. Also, maybe helper functions for manipulating colors, like lighten and darken by a certain amount. And then this library would also hold all of those theme definitions um, that I had talked about. So kind of like sets of colors that look good together and names uh, given to them as well so that you can easily import those themes and then apply them onto uh, display objects. So uh, we'd need some work done to update those objects in order to support it. But the, uh, the core question is like, do we want a color helper library like that as its own uh, repo or would we want to um, include stuff like that in with with the uh, existing libraries kind of uh, scattered out through all the display io stuff i th i think it given that it would apply to multiple libraries it should be its own um otherwise you're going to have folks who want to use it in one place importing for example display text, display text yeah. um so you know simply to t apply the colors to their you know something else um <laughs> Uh, so I think I think it would work best as a separate library. Uh, plus, it sounds like something that um, could end up kind of big. Yeah. And I feel like trying to shoehorn it into another library, um, while it might work right now, it's not scalable. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I agree with Katni on having it as a separate library. The thing I would also add is there's 
kind of this already with fancy LED. Um, mm. It at least does HSV and RGB conversion. And then um, at some point, I think somebody added a color sys module library, if I remember right, which is like the C Python version that does a lot of this. Um, okay. So I agree with Kat I, I agree with Katni that like having a separate library for all this stuff is good, but I would take a look at those two things, color sys and fancy LED, as a as a like make sure that you don't overlap with those things. Um, okay. So if like things that things that color sys does, like it would be better to just do color sys because then C Python it applies to C Python as well. Um, and then there's also uh, the fancy LED side as well. So just take, like, yes, you're on the right track, but take a look at those two things as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with those, so I'll definitely check them out. As a un unrelated but related thing, um, that C Python library needs to be um, refactored because it, it already has two um, .py files uh, in root. Right. Oh, I see this one here. Which doesn't work. Um, and we don't have this in the bundle right now because of the fact that it's kind of ad hoc and we didn't really we didn't really do a whole lot with it. Um, so if it's something that you think you might be using, um, I would greatly appreciate uh, a possible refactor and just getting that sort of maybe bundle ready so that way you've got it available. Yes. Yeah, I just I had not seen the CPython um, <laughs> library before. It's my first time seeing this. But yeah, I can... Uh, I can refactor that. I think it looks like it just needs to have a um, a module or whatever, a folder. Yeah, pack, package, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can yep. do that. Excellent. I wonder if that's the best way to do it or whether whether we should just have two libraries because I think there's only two things in there, right? Like, Yeah. But I mean, wasn't the plan to add more? Yeah, but <laughs> people haven't. So I, I guess what, I, what I'm thinking I instead is... But so the the reason that like the reason that if you if you add a package it means that it will be imported differently than the native C Python one is, mm -mm. I see. Um, and that's why it's weird that it's at the top level right now is that like it's meant so that you can just use about them the same. Um, then I guess my suggestion would be don't refactor it, but um, fix the. Um, Fix the workflow in this one. It'll mean we can't patch this library, but it, it's it's one library out of many. Um, I think we could just split it into two libraries as well. Like we could just have an Adafruit, CircuitPython, C Python, ColorSys library. Okay. Um, and whatever the other thing in there is. <laughs> like I that, it looks I, like there is not the other file that's there is oh, the nothing. one with the Adafruit name, but it has pretty much just the basic template. There's no actual code in it. It looks like. Okay. Yeah. So why don't we, so, we could just rename this to be color okay. says specific. Sounds good. Told me, guys, didn't you find something a few weeks ago where you can import inside the init to basically expose the original class name? I did. Yeah. That was on, um, that was in, well, it was for the the progress bar, actually. Yeah, I think that you were working on, um, I think that's where we found that. But it, I don't know if it would help us on this one because it, because we're trying to match the Python, the C Python import, which is just import color sys. I guess though, well, okay, it would work if this was made into the color sys library um, and not the C Python library. I guess that could work because then it would, it would change the name there. But if this is going to get renamed, then if it's only going to have the one thing, I think we might not run into that issue. I mean, if it could work the same way as in C Python, this means all of the working code from Pimaroni for the Raspberry Pi MCU or um, single board computer would work directly in Circuit Python. Yeah, that's that the would plan. be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, David, it sounds like you have ideas of example code. So I would suggest linking, like considering that as well, because it probably uses a subset of the full API. So it would be good to know what that subset was. Yeah. So um, my suggestion then would be, because I'm looking, there's no examples um, in this. It, this. The example is empty. Um, so we still need to do some stuff to get this bundle ready. Yep. 
Um, but I think if, like I said, if it's something you're going to be referring to or using elsewhere, it probably should be part of the bundle. Okay. So I'll, I'll file a quick issue just stating we need to do some extras to get this bundle ready and um, I will uh, tag you on it if that's okay. Yeah, definitely. All right, excellent. And then I guess a little bit further down the line, so we can move kind of the helper stuff into ColorSys. Would we also want this to contain like the themes and styles, those things to import? Um, no, the that... ColorSys should only be whatever CPython has. Yeah. Okay. So so do whatever you want to do that ColorSys can already do for you and just expand yeah. this for the CircuitPython case. Uh, but it's still totally okay to have like a theme library, a separate theme library would be. Be totally fine okay cool all right i think that uh i think that covers it for this first one here awesome well thank you uh foamy guy and also jose david who's listed here as well um yep. next up we have uh info from david Gloud and v923z maybe i can start with the easy stuff and then you can do the math okay um so I did the thermal camera stuff, and in there I need to find the min and max and do a little bit of math on 768 uh, real number, I guess. And um, I figure out that I could go much faster with Eula, which is obvious, mm -hmm. but okay, when you never try, you don't know. Right. Um, but one thing is that I need to take the data from the MLX library and that provide me an array. And then I need to convert that to your lab. Mm -hmm. And then I do my processing. And then I need to convert it back to display IO bitmap to be able to display. And mm -hmm. we figure out that if there was um, a faster way to copy into bitmap, that would be great. And, and that's the end of my story. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree with you. I'm totally okay if we added something to bitmap or just microlab handling to bitmap. Um, is V923C present? Is Yeah, I... They were, okay, well, they were on earlier, but mm -hmm. I don't know if they are voice yeah he, he, he was catched by the uh, time change um so what Look, i figure looks out like discord's also... having problems for for him oh so um then i did try to find out where it was slow mm -hmm. and i figure out that in mlx90 blah 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 library there is a lot of math and maybe this library could use ulab to be super fast Right. But that's like that, that's very specific issue to that library, which is less interesting. Yeah. But those copy and paste from one buffer to another buffer, this is likely taking some time. And there is yeah. a piece of code where I show you the fastest way I could copy from a ULab array of int into the bitmap, which is palette bitmap or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, if if you have a faster way, I can take it. But this is not where I'm losing time. <laughs> yeah, I th the only thing I can think of is if bitmap allows for a slice assignment. Um, but I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't think that it does. So kind of my first impulse would be, can we add it to the new bitmap tools? Um, mm. Because adding code on M0 boards, and some M0 boards have display I.O. Right. Uh, is a bit dicey these days. So especially if the bitmap tools read into is going to be something that we accept, I think that would be the place to put this. I have a, uh, like anything that conforms to the array um, protocol, and I have a bitmap, and I want to put a, put a sub rectangle. Right. Yeah, I think it, like, it's essentially blitting, right? Me. Yeah, it is, but right now the only kind of source we support is um, a bitmap. So the uh, right. yeah, it's basically adding a, a source as an array to the existing blit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that's a better way to put it. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, so the other, the only question is, who would like to try doing that? Uh, and is it a ULAP stuff or is it a bitmap stuff? This code would go in the core of CircuitPython in the bitmap tools um, module. Right. And it would work with anything that um, in, in terms of C uh, that you can call uh, MP, is it MP get buffer? Yeah. Uh, so that you can treat it as just a, a, an array of memory in the C code. Yeah, so folks who are just listening, V923Z says in the chat, which other objects could benefit from adding the buffer protocol? I can help with that. And we also have uh, microlab.array.2bytes, which is a buffer. Yeah, so I think you would want a ULAB array that was a U16 type, so that you know value 0, or maybe a U8 type, where value 0 represents pallet index 0, and value 1 represents pallet index 1, and so forth. Right. And whether you call two bytes or whether you just rely on the fact that microlab arrays do act like arrays mm -hmm. now in terms of this function that we're talking about, um, that's the thing where we made sure that they could be used with memory view recently, if you remember that, Zoltan. Um, so yeah, the, the complexity of doing it in the core, I don't want to say, you know, if you're new at C, you can pick it up, but I think it's not so hard that you that you shouldn't think of giving it a try, <laughs> whoever you are. If you're listening, think of giving it a try. Yeah. So um, David, I think for you, uh, filing an issue would be really good. And then that's where we can drop all these hints about how to do it uh, that Jeff just talked about. Uh, OK, that's like... my level. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a, <laughs> it's a good place to start. So it's, like, it's totally good to say, like, oh, it would go in bitmap tools. It would be part of Blit, and Blit would be able to just handle uh, inputs from Microlab, um, or more broadly, just the 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 buffer, the underlying buffer stuff from from CircuitPython or from MicroPython generally. Okay. Yeah, and V nine two three C also says I'm also open to adding tools on my side, but I don't. I don't think in this case you need to. Um, I think it's it's a matter of uh, CircuitPython being better about you know sharing memory or copying memory quickly from one place to another. Um, we should also add uh, letting a bitmap be at least a read only memory viewable object, which would ease getting information the other direction into microlab from a bitmap. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge with just interfacing with bitmap is that it does sub bit packing or sub byte yeah. packing. Yeah, if you're if it's not an eight bit bitmap or a 16 bit bitmap, then you'll have some work to do. But at least we could make it memory viewable. And then you, know, you would select if you need to go back and forth like this, you would select an eight bit or a 16 bit. Uh, format in memory. Right. And as we get chips that have more RAM, that's more doable. Yeah, bitmap stuff is so great on the RP2040. It's luxurious. <laughs> yep. OK, so I think we have a, a, a plan on how to get this going forwards, uh, which is David will create an issue with this super helpful info. And then uh, we'll also add uh, some tips about where and how things should be done to that issue and hopefully somebody will pick it up um okay uh we have one more small thing uh in the weeds from v923z which should be super quick to take uh to address so um v923z asks in the note stock uh the circuit python repository is not searchable can anything be done about that um, and this is largely a function of being a fork from MicroPython, uh, which is a it's a GitHub thing for some reason. Um, and I don't <laughs> I don't know why it's a constraint on their end. Uh, has anybody looked into this to understand it more? It's just something that they don't do. And I don't understand their technical reasons for it. I suppose that they have to have one index for each project. And by eliminating all the forks, they have less indexing to do. Um, if you don't, if you aren't conversant with using git grep 
I really recommend it. I mean, it can search through the whole code base of CircuitPython before you blink. Um, it's local, so it has different trade-offs compared to searching online. And that's only directed at searching the source, not like commit messages and issues. Those have their own different searches on GitHub. And they work and on GitHub. They it's work only on code GitHub. Search. I'm not sure about searching, like searching for a commit which uh, has a particular word in the commit message. I'm not sure if GitHub hmm. does that. Hmm. But for searching within the code, uh, Git grep is a really, really great tool. And I'm sure that there is like a graphical front end on it. That's what I would, would try since we're not going to change GitHub, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, personally, I just I just search locally. Um, there is another option we could consider, and Notro actually set this up a while back, which was having a separate site that does search and um, cross-linking. Um, so that's that's an option as well. Is like we could there are open source projects I believe for doing just code search, and that's something that we could we could look at if we really wanted to. Um, but yeah, I I generally just do it in my my local clone. So Git grep is a a sub of git. So that's just a Oh, and I guess that Jeff that includes commit messages then. That's what you're saying. No, git grep only searches the content of files. There's a way to run okay. um uh to to run local searches on commit history. Um there's a flag to git log and then that's used by the the GUI visualizers such as Git K, right. uh, which can be really handy as well. You can also use it to search for commits which changed a string in a file versus in, in a commit message, which is much slower. There are a lot of really awesome local Git search things you can do, and skilling mm -hmm. up on them is definitely going to pay off. Recommend, hmm. recommend, recommend. So, wh like, what is your argument for doing that versus like what I'm doing, which is just like searching the currently checked out source? Um, you mean of using git grep? Yeah. What, what what command do you use to search? Just Silver Searcher AG. Okay. Um, I mean, I think AG has some knowledge of Git built in. Um, what is nice about git grep for me is compared to regular grep. I've never used right. Silver Searcher. Compared to regular grep, uh, regular grep goes into submodules, uh, which can be good or bad. Right. Uh, and it also goes into like the dot git folders, and sometimes it'll say, oh, your, your match is in this binary file. Right. And git grep doesn't do any of those things. Hmm. On the other hand, sometimes you do want to find something and you don't know which submodule it's in. Git grep does not help you. There's not a git grep and do all the submodules, and that can be frustrating. Right. So the Silver Searcher is Git aware, so it knows not to do the Git directory, and then it also um, will ignore stuff in Git ignore. Mm -hmm. um, That's super handy. Then does it look in submodules? It does. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm going to install that right now. <laughs> and it, and the reason it's better than the other reason it's better than grep is that it's it uh, multi it's multi core, so it's real quick. Yeah, I think once you are looking at all those submodules, that may become relevant. When you're looking just in CircuitPython, I don't find that I notice how long it takes. But yeah, yeah for those situations, so, it's going to make a difference. Yeah, so V923Z says, searching locally hinders over the web co collaboration. I can't just send a link to someone else. Yeah. Yes, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of old school in the sense of like, I'm totally okay to like search it locally and then pull it up on the web uh, if I need to find a particular spot. Uh, but I'm also known for not using the best tools for the job sometime. Um, so yeah, I would say like if you really do want like a, 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 a way to send people a link to search results in CircuitPython, I think the, the way that we would have to go is, well, for one, people... This is a known issue with GitHub, and at some point they're going to do it, hopefully. Um, 
but then also like uh there are other options like i said like notro had sent set something up that did searching and it like automatically updated the indexes when pushes were done and stuff so like there's probably solutions out there that we could do as a, as a as a separate place to do all the code search stuff um but really honestly it's not high on my priority so we we would have to figure that out um so yeah, no good, not really, no great answers. Sorry. Um, bug, bug GitHub as well. Okay. Uh, and with that, let's wrap up. Um, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly meeting for March 15th, 2021. Thank you everyone for taking the time to hang out with us. Um, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom and make sure I don't forget to say anything. Um, I, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us who work on CircuitPython who are sponsored by Adafruit, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The, me- the video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services after that. Uh, It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. Check the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter there. Uh, The next meeting... Let's see. I'm just double-checking that it's on Monday. Yep. So the next meeting will be uh, next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And just like today, if you're outside the U.S., beware that I believe the rest of the world will not have done daylight savings yet. So just double check the time again uh, to make sure that uh, you understand what it'll be. Uh, If you uh, would like to be notified about the meeting or speak during the meeting, um, you can be asked to be added to the circuit Python nieces role on discord. That's where we uh, mention when the schedule and stuff is. There's also a calendar that should be able to do this as well. Um, This meeting was held on the Adafruit Discord server, which anybody can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. And we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. uh, And keep um, making CircuitPython and the community great. Uh, See you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Scott, for running the meeting. Mm -hmm. Thanks, all.